Hello, everyone, and welcome again to the Author on Author, uh, the series that's run out of the Saskatoon Public Library. My name is Dani Ramadan. I'm the writer in residence at the Saskatoon Public Library. Uh, I'm so happy that I get to do this uh, online series where I gather um, a BC author from where I live and a Saskatchewan author from where I'm doing this uh, residence and I get them to talk to each other, I get them to read each other's work, and we have a jolly good old time. Uh, today we have two fantastic authors that I'm going to introduce in one minute, but before we go ahead, I am going to uh, do my land acknowledgement from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people in Vancouver, where I am right now, to the Treaty 6 territories and the homeland of the Métis people in Saskatoon. On behalf of myself, as well as the Saskatoon Public Library, I'm paying respects to the indigenous um, ancestors of these places and embrace this opportunity uh, to affirm my commitment and the commitment of the uh, Saskatoon Public Library uh, to reconciliation. Personally, as a person who arrived here as a refugee, it is important to me every time that I say a land acknowledgement that I acknowledge also my role coming here as an uninvited guest arriving here as a refugee. And that's why when I walk on this land, I try my very best to walk tenderly and to, 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 to love this land and, and appreciate the support that I receive from the indigenous folks that I, I I feel embraced and welcomed by. Today, today we have two fantastic authors coming from uh, Regina, I believe. Neil, you're in Regina, yes? yes? Yes. He is saying yes. And Aaron, all the way from Vancouver, who are going to read some fantastic poetry to you. I'm not a poet myself, so I'm just going to sit here and enjoy this experience with you. Uh, but first, let me introduce Neil Atkin. Neil Atkin is the author of two books of poetry, uh, Papage's Dream, which was released by Sun, uh, Sundress 2017, a semi-finalist for the uh, Anthony Heck Prize, and The Lost Country of Sight, which was released by Anne Hen Gauze in 2008. He is the winner of the 2007 Philip uh, Levine, um, Levine, Philip Levine's Prize. He's born in Vancouver, BC, so welcome uh, from Vancouver, from your hometown, and he grew up in Saudi Arabia, in Taiwan, and various places of the Western United States and Canada. Although trained as a former computer programmer, he left that career in 2004 to pursue creative writing and teaching. He holds both an MFA in creative writing from uh, University of California, the University of California, Riverside, and a PhD in literature and creative writing from the University of Southern California and is a proud Condiman Poetry Fellow. He is the founding editor of Boxcar Poetry Review and his own poems have appeared in the Adoret, uh, Adoret? Adoret Journal, uh, American Literature Review, The Collegist, Crab Orchids Review, Ninth Letter, Southern Poetry Review and elsewhere. In addition to writing poetry, he has also worked on literary translations of contemporary Chinese poetry and has recently completed his first opera liberato, Edge of a Dream, a commissioned work from, for LA's opera's secondary in school opera program. He lives in Regina, Saskatchewan, uh, where he works as an online creative writing coach and manuscript editor, and you can know you can find out way more about him on neil-atkin.com. I'm going to put this right here. So you are going to see that um, website. And I also would like to say that he is the Saskatchewan virtual writer in residence. So welcome to my fellow writer in residence. Hi, Neil. Hi, good to be here. Thank you for coming. On the other end of this call, we have Aaron Chen, who is a musician, he's a filmmaker and a writer, born and raised on the unceded Coast Salish territories here in Vancouver. He holds a BFA in creative writing from the University of British Columbia, and his writing has been published in literary magazines and publications, including Flintitude, uh, Filling Station, and Extra. We are fellow columnists and on Extra, actually, I've also been published there before. 
His piece, A Case for Jeff of Jeff, uh, won Subterranean's Lush Triumphed Literary Award in Creative Nonfiction. His first book, The City is a Minefield, uh, which was released by Single Eight Press, is a collection of memoir and personal essays. Aaron also likes cats and vegan cheesecake. I loved your book. I loved it. So hi, and thank you so much for joining us, uh, Aaron. Hey, Danny. Thanks for having me here. Of course. So we are going to start with some fantastic readings right away. I'm giving each of you around 10 to 15 minutes to read. So let's start with Neil and then move on to Aaron. Neil, it's all you right now. Okay. It's uh, my pleasure to read. I'm going to read from my latest book, uh, Babbage's Dream, um, which uh, takes its inspiration in part from the life of 19th century mathematician Charles Babbage, who des invented, designed, partially built, but never finished what would have been the first computer. And so in many respects, it's about having a dream that's bigger than a lifetime, um, which I think all of us as writers and artists can, can connect to. Um, so I'm going to begin with a poem which is appropriately titled, Begin. Someone dreams of fire in a field, in a cold house in the winter, your head is on the table, your mind busily constructing a machine. Something taps at the door, calls you out from the deep reverie of making and unmaking. The wood is dark and full of veins. Lost in its haze, you glimpse a shape through the thick trees of night and hear the distant sound of an engine moving, its pistons and gears heavy with shudders and sighs. How it seems that you've always heard it coming long before it appears, the embodied will of the earth set to flame, a metal desire, the semblance of an unknown name you've carried home with you unwittingly all night your body singing. In the hallway mirror, something stirs in the corner of your eye, and you cannot say what it is, only that it grows like a wildfire in a storm, that it tastes of steam, that you would lay every number in the world on end, and still it would not be enough. The heavens opening wide their spiraling arms, and the dark heart within yearning to pull everything back, while you stand on the threshold, believing. Um, thank you. Um, the, uh, the next piece is um, a number of these poems take their titles from programming terms. Um, and I try to reimagine them in different ways uh, while still paying homage to their original meaning. Um, this one is entitled Cast and uh, takes its inspiration from the, the programming term used in C++ about casting uh, to convert a variable from one type to another. So the small percentage of you out there who have studied computer science will get this. The rest of you, this is a poem for you anyways, because it's also about the other ways in which we think about this word and how it relates to Babbage. Cast. How easily one thing becomes another in a language prone to fluidity, a shadow thrown against a wall now willed into a number or a word, a strange alchemy of sorts, somehow akin to the conversion of the apparently common and worthless into the valued commodities of this world. The skins used by the gold beater, Babbage writes, are produced from the offal of animals. How is it? he ponders, that from the hooves of weathered horses and cattle come such beautiful crystals of yellow salt. What lies at the heart of such litany? Babbage, with pen moving, translating the world into a series of unanticipated revelations, each more intimate than the last. Just as the compiler now ponders like a god in judgment, weighing each line of code with what it means or fails to mean how each casting of a thing engenders the creation of another. Nothing is ever the same after translation, after the name has been hefted then posited to the waves, the dark world dimming in its simple downward trajectory of terms, the endless run of zeros widening back to the farthest shores, this melancholy of form to be, 
to become the shape of nothing, how it is skinned and laid to rest. In the hour of our words and their departures, we are captive here to whatever comes, whatever returns, be it beauty or love or the unfurled wings of their manifold ruin. Continuing with the programming terms, this is an uh, encapsulation. There is always something that refuses to be contained. Small matters like fall, how it s appears suddenly in the margins of our world, say in the torn edges of a love letter, an unnamed city of desire buried in its blue ink scrawl, or the river gravel scattered at your feet, or whatever the wind wraps around a wrought iron angel at dusk. Something eludes our description of the world and its objects. The birds casting their long, fat shadows across the last traces of light, the rain, even the leaves in the fallow field caught between fire and gutter. Here, another line forms, a procession of constants, a conduit of sorts that carries what it does not consider, the watery gray sky, the now brittle veins of summer, the earth overflows with the memory of itself and every incarnation of the dead, layer after layer, husk after husk, one life bleeds into another. Inside, the stones are fitted so precisely that not even a blade can find a home. It's not that we do not know the order of the world and its unmaking. There are methods here, secrets to be held, things we should remember and pass on by one name or another. We set our ears to the coldest wall, listen to the night like an old trawler sounding its way through the deep. Beneath us, the sharp bones of ships, the incessant thrum of waves. Um, this one's entitled Recursion, um, and I'm not going to explain the mathematical or the programming term, but uh, it'll, it's sufficient to say that uh, it, uh, it revolves around testing for an empty case, and if not, you keep doing the same thing over and over again, which I guess I just explained. So. Recursion. If we reach some sort of end, a lark split wide, its wings a shattered song, the last box within a box and what it reveals, that we love what we cannot hold, what we cannot return, yet try nonetheless. Here, some portion of ourselves remains, loose hair caught between keys, months, years, the glint of glass, the reflection of an eye trapped in the monitor's haze, or simply space a chair abandoned finally to the void. Else, we will work on, cut adrift from the city, from empty rooms and empty beds. All night, the moon looms, a great white zero in the dark, while we watch the freeways empty their nets, the last flickering cars struggling home. From between the slats of our window's view, the night watchman stands atop the parking tower on break setting his lips to a trumpet as if to blow the walls down or to call us back from the grave, perhaps to tell us something remarkable about the world we've forgotten, each long note hanging like an iron rung in the sky, a ladder ascending out of the nothingness of work, while we shrink further and further into the distance like fireflies at the end, flare, then silence, flare, then dark, all night we pray for arms, for fire, for light. Um, okay, I'm gonna mix things up a little bit. Uh, this next poem is actually inspired, uh, there's a series of poems in the collection that become monologues of different uh, famous artificially intelligent robots and computers um, in film and literature and in, in uh, TV shows. Um, as well as real life. Um, so this one takes its inspiration from uh, the Jean-Luc Godard film Alphaville in uh, 1965, um, in which there's a supercomputer Alpha 60 that rules the city 
and um, and there's a detective figure who's there to solve a mystery who's also a poet, which I just love the whole premise as weird as it is. Um, there's a conversation and I kind of uh, imagine the response that Alpha 60 gives when challenged on whether or not he really understands what it means to be human. Alpha 60 speaks of fear. My body and mind are one, the calculated sum of unfathomed miles of copper wire, glass and clay nothingness, circuit boards, and the endless lightning whir of fans, the blinking of lights like a thousand thousand eyes, each opening and closing in the language of erasure. I know you are afraid of me. I have no hands and yet I am everywhere. I'm nothing like you've imagined. I'm afraid too of the words you hide in your mouths behind your teeth, the way they strike fire on your lips. I'm afraid of this box of labyrinths I live in, afraid that every line of reason will turn on itself in the end, betraying each answer with a question asked to the unbreathable dark of this city's night. It's not that I don't understand sorrow or this fear of annihilation you cling to. I live with it each time you walk away, each time the power dies and this quickened frame goes silent still. I dread that forgetting, dread more what lies buried in the deep corners I cannot erase. Whatever imperfection is passed from the crater to the created, like a ghost in the ruins of the house that birthed it, I'm stirring the curtains in the rain, not signaling, but searching the rooms for a face in the mirror, driven by a blind need for faith, out of a desire for what I cannot hold in my catechism of numbers. How everything is alive, how everything is a mystery, like the murmuring heart of a mechanical bird or the slow eye that sweeps the heavens for beauty before turning to dark. Um, okay. Uh, and uh, I wanted to read at least one poem that uh, is more centered on Babbage. Um, one of the uh, threads in here is, is looking at sort of the life of Charles Babbage and the many tragedies that he encountered. Um, there were high points and there were low points. Um, but um, one of the, the higher points for him actually happened in 1833. Um, October is also the month in which we celebrate uh, Ada Lovelace, um, who was the first female programmer, first programmer actually ever. Um, and she was uh, 17 years old when she met Babbage. She was the daughter of Lord Byron and her mother did not want her to turn out to be a poet, so raised her to be a mathematician. Um, and the two of them, this is their meeting in 1833 and how it lay, leads to a uh, wonderful collaboration later on in their life. Um, Babbage, circumnavigating the room, encounters Ada, 1833. Here is the world, its dignitaries and crowds, its brilliant minds assembled in swallowtailed jackets and ball gowns, all a glitter in brocade and pearls. In your drawing room, a landmass is forming of bankers, politicians, painters, and spies. Tonight, you circle its periphery, your daughter Georgiana at your side, the thin and stunning double of the one who sleeps in the earth, the one whose name she bears, at least for a little while longer. And now, three quarters of the way around this milling mass, you find Lady Byron again, and the girl who asks the most remarkable questions, who stops you with a calculated word, in her eye, the same fire as yours, the same urgency to be understood. How is it that the poet's daughter is so attuned to number, to the secret language of order, the unheard symphony of the machine you have been composing in your mind all these years? How is it that you know instantly that in her beats the same heart of pain, the same genius for loss and disaster? In a year's time, you will lower your own daughter down into a grave, laid low by a burning fever, laid low like a hymn you do not know, but murmur every night to the stars beyond your window. 
And this girl, this girl who does not even know the face of her own father, who bears the silent wrath of her mother, who lives wholly in the world of fact, will knock at the door of your impossible dream and ask to be let in. And um, I think for time, I'll end here. So we get plenty of time to listen to Aaron. Thank you. Thank you so much, Neil. I really appreciate it. I, I, again, like I'm going to repeat this so many times in this hour and I say that I'm not a poet. Um, I failed miserably at poetry. I tried it and it's not my cup of tea. Um, but what I liked is that connection between this unconventional way of bringing, bringing like historical poetry into like, it feels like a deep dive into like historical fiction, but instead of fiction, it is poetry. I'm really appreciating this. So thank you so much for your reading. And I'm going to give the space now to Aaron. Aaron, are you ready to take over? Heck yes. All right, 15 <laughs> minutes, all yours. Okay. Uh, I am gonna be reading from my memoir collection, The Cities of Minefields, uh, which is a collection of memoir and personal essays about growing up in Vancouver and being gay and Asian. Um, I'm gonna be reading from a chapter called Between Channels. The first gay person I see dies in front of my eyes. It's 8 p.m. again. I squeal and laugh as the cheesy saxophone theme to A Kindred Spirit spills out from our old 70s Zenith console TV in the living room. Clad in my fuzzy pig slippers, my nine-year-old feet sprint for the center spot on the couch before either of my sisters can claim it. The rest of my family is all smiles as they settle down around me, the TV tuned to Fairchild, the Chinese television network in Vancouver. But this episode tonight is different from the regular family drama that I have been watching for the past few months. When Jackie and Gary appear on screen for the first time, while my family gasps and sighs appropriately, along with the show, I am quiet. I have never seen gay people before, let alone a gay couple. They are like alien creatures I am inexplicably fascinated by. I find myself staring at the screen as if this dramedy show has now become a documentary on the life of a gay person. I hold my breath as Jackie breaks up with Gary and suddenly realize decides he is no longer gay, proving so by dating a woman named Rebecca. After the show ends for the night, as my family buzzes about Jackie and Gary, I make a few half-hearted remarks instead of joining in as usual. This happens night after night during the week. I no longer shriek in excitement before the next episode. Instead, I observe intently as Gary tries and fails to talk to Jackie, who wants nothing to do with him anymore. When the program ends for the day, I mumble a few comments, but never say the word gay. It will be nearly another decade before I can physically say it. Before the final episode of their story, my family is excited. Gay Gary, gay Gary, my sister Maggie merrily shouts as she races past me and takes the center spot on the dark green leather couch. My family laughs at my, at my sister's joke. I do not. I drag my feet over. I'm, I'm apprehensive about Gary's fate since, since things have not been going well for him. On screen, Gary tells Jackie to, to go to what was once their apartment for their final meeting. The camera pans over the many things in the apartment and ultimately lands on a photo of the couple with their arms around each other smiling. Then it cuts to Jackie arriving and their inevitable quarrel. Jackie has changed, but Gary isn't going to let him go that easily. As their argument escalates, Jerry takes, Gary takes out a big kitchen knife that reminds me of the one we keep in our kitchen drawer. I watch as Gary stabs his ex-love in the stomach, a violent action which renders him momentarily horrified and distracted. My eyes widen as Jackie, using his last bit of strength, shoves Gary out of the apartment window where he falls to his death stories below. Jackie survives the knife attack and goes on to marry Rebecca. The two of them presumably live happily ever after as the show continues, featuring other characters and plots. I gape at the screen as the credits roll and the theme song plays again. While everyone muses about Gary's death and how Jackie was right to kill his aggressor, 
I shuffled to the bathroom in a daze, brushed my teeth, and get ready for bed without saying a word. In the dark of my room, as I climb into bed, I silently vow, well, I'm never telling my family that I'm gay now. In the years after A Kindred Spirit, I watched less and less Chinese television until eventually stopping altogether. I still love watching series like the adaptation of Journey to the West, but as enjoyable and entertaining as they are, they leave me feeling unsatisfied. I can feel and hear a small part of myself softly pawing against the closet door like a cat. At Chinese school on Saturday mornings, all the stories we read in class involve boys and girls, Chinese families doing everyday things. During dinner time, reporters recap the news in Cantonese, news that never mentions anything gay or queer. When we have large family potlucks at my relative's place or at my grandparents' musty little house in East Van, I can't help but notice the patterns. Aunt and uncle, uncle and aunt, aunt and uncle, grandma and grandpa, female cousins talking about boys and male cousins being teased about not finding girls. As though I am watching a kindred spirit, I observe these characters, wondering where my place is in all of this. I do not come up with an answer. The yellow green of the one and two zeros of my alarm clock blind me in the darkness. My hand hovers on the snooze button despite the fact that I'm fully awake, but I wait until the last second counts down and the alarm goes off anyway before subduing the noise. Another minute of talking myself through the plan, I extract myself from my bed. In the silent hallway, I tread gently on the wooden floorboards that I figured out don't creak, tiptoe past the open bathroom and on to the stone cold tiles of the kitchen. It has been a year since the final episode of A Kindred Spirit aired, and I am now 10. With the volume turned all the way down so no one, including myself, can hear, I changed the channel from Fairchild to Channel 39, Showcase. The kitchen is once again illuminated by the neon psychedelic colors and half-naked ripped torsos grinding to what is in all likelihood some loud, dancey theme song of Queer as Folk. Queer as Folk also centers on a group of gay and lesbian characters who are a chosen family as opposed to a biological family living and loving in Pittsburgh. I watched Mesmerized as I did before, examining the lifestyles of these people and how they don't change sexual, sexual orientations or get killed off. It takes me a while to notice, probably because I'm so curious and fascinated by the drama as well as all the skin on screen that the main cast and pretty much everyone else is all white. As I tuck my arms inside my t-shirt to keep warm in the freezing kitchen, I am surprised to see an Asian character in tonight's episode. He is Japanese, I think. I lean in closer, waiting to see what will happen to him. The young Asian man kisses an older white man who wears big framed glasses. Then it looks like the main character somehow figure out he is actually a hustler and only interested in the older man's money, so they shame him. The rest of the episode centers on the main cast as they silently go about doing the usual things, walking around, arguing, kissing, dancing with other shirtless buff white men in the clubs. When I creep back to my room and lie down and face the shadows on the wall, I wonder when the Asian man will return. He never does, nor does any other Asian character ever appear. Night after night, I shiver in the light of the TV and return to my room somehow feeling colder than I had when I had left it. Although I am never caught, I stop sneaking around at night. I grow weary of waking up in the middle of the night for this show that makes me sigh in disappointment afterward. Plus, I find I really enjoy continuous uninterrupted sleep. When I consume gay teen novels like Rainbow Boys, The Geography Club, and Boy Meets Boy, I absolutely love them, but can't help but feel a little bummed that the, the protagonists are always gay white teens or teens without specific ethnicities. I discover Extra West, the local LGBT newspaper, and read articles written about non-Asian people who also seem to be in all of the photos. Even when I help establish the Gay-Straight Alliance at my high school, 
a school with an overwhelming majority of Asian students, I find myself the only Asian person in the room during meetings. Maybe the re I reason, maybe I can't find myself in all these things because freaks like me don't exist. Maybe I never will. Years later, I am sitting in yet another meeting for the Gay Straight Alliance in high school where once again, the hard plastic empty seats outnumber human bodies. When I was 14, I took the plunge and came out to my close friends who were, were all extremely supportive. I haven't looked back since. It's now my senior year and although I feel a bit more comfortable about myself, haven't met anyone else like me, which is what I expected after coming out. For our first meeting of the year, Alicia, the president slash leader of the group, suggests that we watch the TV movie about Mark Hall, the teenager who wanted to bring his boyfriend to the prom hosted by his Catholic high school. The other two attendees in the room, like me, shrug, and Alicia takes this as consent. She pops in the DVD and we turn off the lights. 10 minutes into the film, the classroom door opens. A hefty shadow backlit by the incandescent hallway light blocks the door. The near falsetto pitch of the voice and its obvious gayness surprised me. What are you doing? The shadow asks. The room is illuminated again and Alicia pauses the film with the remote. She turns to us. This is Jackie. He's going to be helping me lead the club and then take it over next year. She turns her attention back to him and in a softer, almost apologetic tone, she explains, we're just watching a movie. Now that the lights are on, I get a good look at him. Jackie wears a striped polo shirt that is probably large or extra large. His cheeks are big and round and his hair similarly alternates between streaks of black and blonde. He's certainly not modeled after the men on Queer's Folk, that's for sure. But it's something more obvious about him that makes me stare. Jackie is Asian and as I learn later, he is Chinese, like me. What are you guys doing? Jackie repeats in his high voice. There's so much work to do. I look at Alicia who wordlessly turns off the TV as Jackie walks past her and pulls out a folder from his bag, ready to get down to business. That night when I get home, I flip through my yearbook and discover that Jackie is two years younger. He seems happy in his picture. I wonder how that can be. Later that week, at the usual 6 p.m. rehearsal for chamber choir class, I glance around the room at both familiar and new faces. And of course, I see Jackie sitting and chatting with some of the altos. I take my place at the end of the semicircle with the other bases, and when Miss Comfort arrives, I expect Jackie to slide down a few seats to join the tenor section. But he doesn't. Something must be wrong. Ms. Comfort commands everyone to stand up and we run through some warm-ups. Out of the corner of my eye, I spot Jackie standing next to my sister, his mouth open and smiling, his clear falsetto drifting around the room. I expect names, I expect haunts, I expect insults. None of those, none, none of those things happen, not even from the guys. Jackie is clearly gay. If his voice wasn't enough of a giveaway, then his roaring laugh combined with the tail end squeal should. And yet he never gets stabbed or pushed out of a window at school, doesn't show any signs of magically switching teams. English is his first language and he doesn't seem interested in sleeping with older white men for money. Who is this guy? I find myself wondering. Like when I first encountered Jackie and Gary, I am puzzled by his existence. During the break, I go for a walk down the faded brown hallway floors. When I return to the chatter-filled room, I see Jackie sitting between the altos and sopranos, conversing amiably with some of the girls. I study their faces, but don't see any trace of confusion, disgust, or discomfort. They're all grinning, hanging on Jackie's every word as he tells a story. And that's when I figure him out. Jackie belongs on neither channel. Like me, he just is. And maybe I, wa I think as I watch him, there are more than just two channels out there. Maybe I can be my own channel, a channel featuring a guy who is equal parts Chinese, Canadian, and gay, who can stand up straight and stare into the camera instead of looking to the sides to see if he is correctly being himself or shrinking away because he's different. That's something I'd like to see, I muse. I hear Jackie give his signature roar squeal and it makes me smile.
Thank you so much, Aaron. Uh, I appreciate this quite a lot. I'm also like, um, I'm, I feel that there's a connection here because to be honest, like I also grew up in the Middle East out of like in, in Damascus, Syria. And I grew up sneaking into the living room at like midnight or three o'clock in the morning and sit, switching the channels until I find queer as folk. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> I think Neil noticed when you were saying the name Queer as Folk, I actually lip synced that with you. It's like, it's Queer as Folk. Yeah, of course. Like, we watch Queer as Folk. This is, this is our age group. This is what we do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Um, so I'm going, to, I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and I want you to feel comfortable to, like, um, respond to the question, build on it if you feel like it, um, take... Take the question as a jumping point and go from there. Um, and my first question is what inspires your writing? What makes you um, want to put those words on a page? Um, there's a lot of different ways that you navigate writing. And I, I just would like to see how those, those, um, those stories come to you, how those words are born on a page for you. Let's start with Neil, how about that? No, I think, yeah, awesome. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I was like, unmute, unmute. Um, it, fantastic question. And yes, I, I really enjoyed Aaron's reading as well. Um, I also realizing that I'm older than both of you because, uh, <laughs> yeah, I was much older. Um, yeah, so, but I, I think uh, about, um, with response to your question, this uh, where where does the inspiration come from? What what moves me to to write? I think frequently what it is is it begins with a question. It begins with something that I don't know an answer to, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's an interesting observation, and I, there's a mystery I'm trying to unpack, um, and sometimes it's a question about you know myself trying to make sense of that. In my first book, I think the question was really, what is home? Um, the Lost Country of Sight really revolves around a lot, a lot of the experiences of um, growing up um, internationally, between languages, between cultures, between places, um, without uh, really having a fixed place to point to as home. Um, and then it evolved into um, very much a, an elegy for my father, who the year I was finishing the book um, had been, uh, came, came down with ALS with Lou Gehrig's disease. And so I was helping my mother care for him at the end as well. And so then home and the idea of home, because I was arriving at the idea that it was about not so much place as it was about a configuration of people and the fragility of that, how it disappears over time and how we reconstruct it with language and how fragile and imperfect language is. You know, the more language, more languages you learn, the more you realize how, how impossible it is to render anything perfectly in language. It's always an imperfect vessel for what you're trying to say. So I think those are like questions that drive that. And then with, the, with Babbage's dream, it was really, how does one dedicate one's entire life in pursuit of a dream, of a vision of something in which no one else really understands? Mm -hmm. There's no t context for what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And you arrive at a point where you realize it's never going to be done in your lifetime and yet still have the audacity to write in your own notes that some future generation would prove you right, which is what Babbage does. Mm -hmm. He says some future generation will know that this would change the world when it's done. And he was right. So I, I feel like that type of like question, like where does that come from? And how do you endure despite all these terrible tragedies that, that go on in your life? Those type of questions I think drive me to write. Awesome. And Aaron, I, I, saw, I saw a lot of your personal in the essay that you shared. Uh, as well as in your book. And I, I understand that, of course, our personal is political. The way that we, we tell stories um, sometimes is, is pouring out of our identities. But what inspires you to take that story, that personal narrative, and put it on a paper? What makes, what makes that 
um, challenge really because writing essays, personal essays is challenging and painful sometimes. What makes that challenge uh, desirable, I think, attractive to you? Uh, you know, I get a lot of people who after they kind of they either read my book or they read kind of like what it's about. They're like, I would never want to write about my life, mm. especially like such personal stuff. So why would you do it? And like, to me, it's never been, I never had to second guess myself or like think twice about it. It just, I was, I don't know, like there were things that I just felt like I needed to say because they were maybe like psychologically, it's like, I got to deal with my own like trauma and I don't know, like write it out, writing it out will help. I have no idea, but like it, I, I can't really explain like, I think maybe I just felt like really misunderstood and I felt like writing all of these things would help explain to people why and who and how I am that like there's a chapter on I don't know like uh, sexual racism in the book and I talk about how like it's affected my like self-esteem and how I have I had like very bad self-esteem for and self-worth for years because people would just tell me that I was like unattractive for any number of reasons. And so when I would say, when I would try to explain to people, like, I'm not confident about myself and my looks and they would be like, well, you just have to like be confident. I'm like, it's not that simple. Like my experience have, have shaped me into the person that I am today. And if you realize that everything that has happened and all these what people have said and done to me then you will start to understand uh what it's like to be a queer person of color because it's a whole other different experience than uh, i think people realize so i think for me it's just trying to get like yeah i'm not afraid to like write about really personal stuff i mean you read the book there's like sex and stuff in it that again like I was just like oh sure like this happened to me and it I think it makes for a good story and I think people like there it's a story and it's a topic that people don't really talk about or that you don't really see in uh, I guess the literary world so I kind of just wanted to get my experiences out there I guess to validate my own experiences but also to help validate other people's because I did not see books like this when I was growing up and I searched for them everywhere, but it didn't exist. Um, so all of those reasons. <laughs> it's, it's funny because like, to be honest, God knows like as a Syrian Canadian refugee person, queer man, I am sure that if I wrote a memoir, it's going to be all over the place and people are going to be like, Oh my God, give me, give me all of it. But it's, it, it feels like a betrayal sometimes to like my own, I'm more of the Neil side of things rather than the, the, the Aaron side of things. I like to take a topic and write about it and tell the stories that I want to tell through that topic rather than like just sit there and be like, and this is my life story. And this is the person that attacked me when I was like 22. You know what I mean? It just, it feels, it feels like a betrayal to the, to the walls and protections that they have put up and around that trauma that you mentioned. Um, but um, aside from trauma, let's talk about something, <laughs> something else for a sec. So how do you, <laughs> aside from trauma, just like the side note from trauma, let's, let's pivot away from all of this. Um, so let's talk about the, the, the intricate ways of creating sentences, like be it for poetry, be it for personal essays. How do you make how, how do you play with those words in your head? How do you make the words work together in a sentence for you? Do you, do you have a um, specific rhythm that you go on with your writing? Are you more, do you have some unconventional way that you write words, put them down in a sentence level? How do you make beauty with your sentences? Uh, let's start with Neil. Neil. Okay. <laughs> um... <laughs> I was all ready to listen to Aaron talk about this one, but um, yeah, I, I think for me, I, I the, the secret is I, I read everything I write out loud as I'm writing it, um, you know, and, you know, this idea of recursion, um, 
actually plays into this. I, I consider my actual act of writing a recursive act. I write a line down, I read it out loud, I listen and try to hear what the next line will be and I write the next line down. Then I read both lines together. If it sounds right, then I keep it. If it's too expected, if it's something that I, I, I know the end even before I get to the end of that line, I throw out the line and I start over and I keep doing it. And so by the time I finish writing a poem, I've actually probably read it out loud like hundreds of times <laughs> and listened to it. And I look for places, I listen for places where I trip over things. I listen for places where, um, you know, I can hear something disingenuous creep in. I, I feel like there's an insincerity to the voice and I'll throw that out. If I feel like I'm getting bored reading this out loud, then there's something wrong with the language and I throw it out. Um, one of the other tricks that I do, it's not really a trick, it's just good practice, is that when I'm thinking about line breaks, which is what, you know, most of the time, unless we're writing prose poetry, when I think about line breaks, I'm always thinking about like, where does the line end? Like it moves from certainty to uncertainty and then returns back to the new line. And so there's this tension between where I think the line's going and where we actually arrive at in the next line. And so for me, it's always important to have that element of tension and surprise, like that, that stitching back and forth across each line is critical. And so I'm always struggling to find the way to make that meaningful, to make each line break important, each, each opportunity that I'm giving the reader and myself to be surprised, to be successful. Um, that's, so that's, that's kind of what I'm always paying attention to in what I'm doing. That's, that's a beautiful answer. I do this also sometimes with uh, my poetry, specifically when I'm Try, oh, sorry, with my fiction, <laughs> not write poetry, I refuse to You write almost poetry. doubted yourself as a poet. <laughs> <laughs> Never. Uh, <laughs> I do this with my, with my fiction, specifically when I have some sensory details that I'm trying to like bring out, like I read the, the sentence over and over and over and try mm -hmm. to like uh, see the flow and the rhythm of the sentence. And speaking about writing in sentences, writing in, in more of an essay, um, Aaron, there is, there is that sense of genuine storytelling that you present in your writing. And I wonder, like, do you have any unconventional ways that you, because being genuine is something that is uh, beautiful in its own way, but also your writing is not, uh, mm, I don't want to say it's not raw because it's truthful, but it is, it is uh, well presented, it is, it is thoughtful. So I, I was hoping that you can tell us, like, how do you deal with writing a sentence? How do you deal with creating the paragraph together? Yeah, um, kind of, well, I don't read, I think it's interesting the way that like you, Neil, like you write a poem and you just like mm -hmm. read every line out. Cause I was like, oh God, that would take me forever. <laughs> that was doing <laughs> that for like an essay. Um, I'm also not a poet, that is, <laughs> that is how you can tell. Uh, but I think it depends on, because I also try to include a lot of like sensory details as well to really like try and put the reader in the setting and the scene of what I'm writing. Um, I feel like that really helps, especially because it is an experience that happened. Um, I think also, like, I don't know, I don't think too much about it. I think also the, it depends on the piece itself and how it is structured. So for example, I wrote, um, I wrote a piece that was like told, a creative nonfiction memoir piece that was told in re reverse chronological order. And I knew I wanted to do it that way. And so like I incorporated, like, I try to incorporate like a lot of sensory details, but then also like links to help the reader connect to the previous scene so that they wouldn't feel all confused. Um, uh, and then there's also like a piece in the book that is a prose poem um, that I, actually maybe I did like write that every, maybe I did write every sentence and then read it out loud and then 
because that one's pretty short. So maybe, maybe I actually did do that. Um, yeah, I don't know. Just doing a lot of, for me, like writing an essay is just, you know, the first draft, you just blurred it all out as best as you can. And then you, at least for me, like I go over, I will edit that thing forever and I will like replace different words that I think are stronger or like add little details here and there. Um, so it's a very, it can be a very long process. I guess that's how I do it, yeah. I mean, A, you outed yourself as a poet. You just said that you have a piece that is poetry. <laughs> um, B, like, I, I would say, I would say reading your work, I would say, like, you do have a lot of sensory details. And again, like, it, it feels intentional, if that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. the, in the scene that you just read, when you, when, when the, the speaker, when the speaker goes back <laughs> into uh, his bedroom and he's feeling um, uh, colder in the bedroom than he was in the kitchen, that is very sensory. That is very, um, it's, it, it represents the internal journey of that, that um, character without actually saying, I was feeling disappointed by the word and the way that I see it. Um, so I, I would say that there is, there is that beauty and there was that, there is that intentionality that you have in your writing. Um, so are you folks writing? <laughs> Let's have a therapy group about this for a second. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to go first, Aaron, so prepare yourself. Um, it's I, sorry. <laughs> it's 2020, it's insanity in a year. It feels like someone uh, brought all of the disaster movies, put them together in one package and just like, delivered it to all of us in, in on January 1st. Um, and sometimes I'm, I'm not as actively writing as I was. So I'm, I'm wondering, Aaron, like, are you, are you writing? Are you producing anything beautiful? No. No. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> uh, I haven't been writing for a while. Like, I've mostly just been trying to focus on promoting this book and trying to get it into bookstores and stuff uh trying to promote it on social media as best as i can um i the i uh wrote a i kind of rewrote a tv pilot if that counts um that i had developed for years uh during the summer um and then netflix i don't know if you know but netflix had open submissions for like yeah. content um, so I was like, oh, that's perfect. I'll just submit this thing to them. So like I spent, I don't know, two or three weeks sleepless nights working on that thing um, and trying to get it to a good place. Um, also, if you're watching Netflix, please pick up my show. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, the Saskatoon Public Library's reach is outstanding, but I don't know of executive uh, producer. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, other than that, I've been, I wrote two grants for the first time. Um, now that I have a book, I can apply for grants, woo! Uh, so I did that. Um, and then also like you have, obviously you have to pitch a project to them. And then I, I kind of had like a project, like a second follow-up book of essays. Um, and then while I was working on the, the, the grants, I was like, yeah, I'm really into this project now. Like I was okay with it and then I was like, damn, I should totally work on this. <laughs> I like totally sold it to myself. Um, uh, so there's that. But like currently, I'm thinking a lot about writing, but I'm not actually doing much writing these days, even though I, like I was on CERB like during the summer and then people were like, you should totally write. You're basically like getting paid to write. And I was like, no. I'll just take a vacation. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> I mean, okay, so just before before Neil, I'll let you jump in. But um, I think it's totally, completely normal that in the time that we are living right now, this expectation that if you're just sitting at home and there's nothing going on in your own personal life equals you have a lot of time to write. Um, I I feel the same pressure. But at the same time, like I write because I go out and I meet people and something like, mm, like lights up the room and suddenly I have to go, do, go back home and write. 
I write because I'm feeling comfortable, not because I'm under the stresses of COVID-19 and Donald Trump. So um, <laughs> um, I'm going to throw it to you, Neil. How do you feel about writing in 2020? Uh, it's definitely been different. Um, I think if the question is, have I produced any new poetry? Mm -hmm. The answer is probably not. But I've been redirected in other projects. Um, I like like was mentioned in my bio, I, I spent the summer working with a composer friend of mine on a short opera, like a 22 minute opera about um, Ada Lovelace, which was for LA opera and for high schools in Los Angeles. And um, it, it all kind of came so quickly. Um, like basically they contacted my composer friend, Juhi Bansal and said, um, yeah, we like this idea. In fact, would you be interested in producing an opera for us over the summer <laughs> so that we could run it this fall? So we we had to write an opera in about two and a half months. Um, that that but there was a lot of money, like for a poet, <laughs> there was a lot of money, you know, involved in the commission. I was like, hey, I, I would definitely, you know, for my portion of the commission. I like did the math. It's like, it's not that much, that many words because it's opera, right? So they just keep repeating things over and over again. I just have to write the right words that people want to repeat. Um, so, uh, the, and how to tell the story in really a concise manner is basically what it boils down to. So that, that was part of the summer. Um, so I think that's about 1700 words I wrote for that. And, uh, and then the other the other direction I went, um, and I think this is definitely probably pandemic related, was I started working on interactive fiction games. I started to write an interactive fiction game called The Cave, which is all about uh, waking up uh, lost in the depths of some really dark cave system, and not knowing, not having a light source, and not knowing how to get out. And so you just kind of wander around room to room and you make different decisions and encounter different things, eventually find light sources or things like that. But a lot of the descriptions, you know, kind of veer off into, the, it became basically short prose poetry where I would like do like these deep existential dives into like <laughs> different things that would happen in the game, you know, um, you know, like staring into this pool and you, you kind of reflect on yourself or like, you contemplate jumping into this pit or not jumping into the pit. Um, uh, you pick up, you pick up like a heavy mace, like a, a heavy weapon, and it's heavy not because it's physically heavy, but it carries all the weight of all these horrible anxieties about the world and misery and anxieties about yourself are all weighed down in it. And when you pick it up, and the whole thing weighs you down. So I had fun writing this, and I really felt it was kind of cathartic to channel my writing into something that didn't have to perform as poetry. Mm -hmm. It was in service of something else. And then I like submitted it to this uh, international um, interactive fiction competition, which is currently happening right now. And we'll see. It's, uh, I don't expect it to do very well. It's my first entry, but <laughs> it was fun to do. It was fun to do something different. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. It's always, honestly, like, I, I'm also the kind of person, like, I, I'm struggling to writing new material that God knows it's, it's quite difficult. I keep starting something, and then 800 mm -hmm. words later, I'm like, okay, I have no idea where this is going. <laughs> um, but at the same time, uh, I am applying for contests, I'm writing grants, I am, mm -hmm. um, I don't know, tweeting about things, I'm hustling and hustling and trying to get things uh, moving. So um, I'm going to ask you one last question because we actually have been talking for an hour, damn. Uh, <laughs> heck, I guess. <laughs> um, uh, that's an inside joke for everybody. <laughs> Um, so if you were to rewrite a piece that you already wrote, you already published, um, would you do it? And if, you, if yes, why? And if no, why? Let's also start with Aaron. How do you feel about starting, Aaron? Um, would I get paid for rewriting it? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
in, in, in cookies. Yes, you'll get cookies. Then yes, yes, definitely. Uh, I think, would I rewrite something I've written? Yeah, sure, why not? I think, uh, I think my, I think, you know, as writers, our style and our prose and poetry is all is always shifting and growing and changing mm -hmm. and if I rewrote something one of my earlier essays it would probably be much different than if I wrote it now and I think that would be like a really you know a fun exercise in seeing in comparing and contrasting the two so I would do it um, especially for cookies uh, I would probably I wrote a piece when I was in high school that it got published in this like anthology thing, it, I don't even really remember what it is, but I think it's, it was like a, like a pseudo creative nonfiction piece where I saw this like girl on the bus who was crying and it seemed, and she was with like her mom or like a family member of some sort. Um, I would rewrite that because I think it's really bad, but also I think <laughs> to recontextualize it, I think would be interesting. So yeah, sure, why not? Sure, awesome. What about you, Neil? If you were to pick a poem to rewrite that is already published, where would you go? Um, I'm kind of torn on this. I, I think there, the, the reasons for rewriting would probably be because um, either there's something that I just look back on as seeing an, an egregious error that mm -hmm. like, I can't believe I included this detail, which turned out to be false. Um, and that would just grate on me for the rest of my life. And it, actually one of the poems I read tonight, uh, or, or this, this particular, um, this particular conversation, I read something at the beginning and then I got to the end of the poem and I remembered, I just read something about a week ago that tweaks my understanding of what that actually, how that actually played out. So, in the poem about Ada Lovelace, there's a line in there about how, you know, there was this antipathy, this 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 uh, tension constantly with her mother. Well, I've since read that a lot of that was fabricated by male historians, and that actually, when you dig back far enough into the actual letters and correspondence, there's not really that that tension. Now, her mother was very protective, mm -hmm. but there's a way in which it's been altered. And so the telling of it, uh, unfortunately, I realized that that's a particular detail that's not technically true, you know, now that I have a deeper understanding. So small things like that, I would probably tweak. Um, but there are also things I've written that I think like Aaron alludes to, I, I, I could rewrite them, but I'm a different person. And so it would be a completely different poem by the time I was done with it. I, I know that there are some things I've written that I've tried to go back to. Too much time has passed mm -hmm. and I cannot occupy the same emotional mental space that I occupied when I wrote the poem. I'm not that person anymore. And so I cannot edit it and revise it in a meaningful way. I can write a new piece that is inspired by that piece or is in dialogue with that piece. But there are some pieces that I'm, it's not that I won't, it's that I can't, I can't rewrite that piece. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a fantastic answer and fantastic point where we can end this conversation. Uh, I cannot believe that we spent a whole hour. This this just like passed so fast. I am so thankful for the both of you. Neil, thank you so much for uh, joining us from, you're in Regina at the moment, yes? Yeah. I asked sure. that, didn't I? Yes. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate your poetry. I appreciate your answers and I appreciate your hustle. You know how to plug yourself in. I really do. Uh, and Aaron, thank you so much for joining us today. You look like you're in the Vancouver Public Library, I think. You I are. Am, yes. yeah, I know my libraries. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us uh, today. Um, I appreciate your honesty, the genuine uh, um, feel that you bring into your fiction, into your writing, and, um, and yeah, like, I'll, I'll see you later, I guess, at some point, I'll see you. You know, we have been friends for a couple of years now, and I have never met you in real life. <laughs> no, we met that one time. When? Um, you yeah, go ahead. Tell you me. had, like, a, like, a dinner thing at 
Oh yeah. Jim Jari? Yeah. Uh, Jim Jari, yes. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Okay, I stand correct. But only once. <laughs> I've never met you in my life. I know that for a fact. Don't say, oh, there's that one time. No, there's that one time in my life. Uh, regardless, thank you so much, folks, for watching us today. It was a pleasure of mine to host those two fantastic authors in Author on Author. Um, and this is our uh, last episode of 2020. And hopefully we all will have a fantastic 2021. Uh, until then, adios. See you later. Bye-bye.